Let's have our seats, please. Thank you very much, Covenant University Band. Let us appreciate them. Thank you. Now, first, let me remind all of us, before we, before we had the procession, that this is the 20th inaugural lecture of Covenant University. That is in the series of Covenant University inaugural lectures. Let us appreciate God for this experience. And indeed, we want to welcome you to this auspicious occasion. But before we start, let us establish protocols. So at this very crucial juncture, I'm going to be acknowledging the following officers. First, the Chancellor and Chairman Board of Regents, Dr. David Oyedepo, the Vice President, Education, Living Faith Church Worldwide, Pastor Mrs. Faith Oyedepo, esteemed members of the Board of Regents present, our Vice Chancellor, Professor A.A.A. Atayero, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Akan William Bassi, the Acting Registrar, Dr. Larry Amodu, other Principal Officers of the University, members of the University Senate, Deans of Colleges, the Dean of Postgraduate School, the Lecturer, our own dear Professor Jonathan A. Aremu. Can we put our hands together? Faculty and staff here present, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, kings and queens of Hebron, members of the press, and we want to thank God for this privilege and opportunity. At this moment, we shall be situating our welcome, but uh, anchoring that will be the registrar, we'll also be introducing key officers of the university. Can we please rise as the Chancellor and Chairman Board of Regents of Covenant University, Dr. David Oyedepo, arrives. You are welcome, sir. Please be seated. I was just telling us about the fact that a crucial part of this uh, occasion is to introduce key officers of the university and of course to situate the welcome for, at this occasion. And to do that is the acting registrar of Covenant University, Dr. Larry Amadou. Can we please show some appreciation? The Chancellor, sir, and the Chairman, Board of Regent. I have the singular honor today of introducing to you the members of the management on the high table. Starting from my left here, I want to introduce the Dean of Student Affairs, that is Professor Conrad Omoemi. Please let's put our hands together. <laughs> Seated next to him is the Director of Financial Services, that is Mr. Paul Waje. Please let's put our hands together. <laughs> Seated next to him, is our Director, Center for Learning Resources, Dr. Promise Ilo. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to respectfully skip to this other side because our speaker today will get a due recognition and introduction. I would like to move on to my extreme right. That is the Dean, College of Engineering, Professor David Omoli. <laughs> the Dean, College of Science and Technology, Professor Kola Wali Ajanoku. The Dean College of Business and Social Sciences, Professor Philip Alege. The Dean of College of Leadership Development Studies, Professor Innocent Chilua. And representing the Dean of uh, SPS, that's uh, School of Postgraduate Studies, we have Professor Obina Uwe. You're welcome, sir. I have the Deputy Vice Chancellor here, we have Professor Akan Williams. I have the Vice Chancellor of Covenant University, Professor AAA Atayero. And ladies and gentlemen, I most respectfully present to you the Chancellor and the Chairman, Board of Regents of Covenant University, Dr. David Oyedepo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Registrar Covenant University. At this very important time, we'll be having our 
vice chancellor, come and give us welcome remarks. He has been introduced. I have the privilege to once again mention and, of course, introduce the vice chancellor, Covenant University. For those who are guests who don't know him, he is the multiple award winning vice chancellor of Covenant University, Professor A. 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 Atayero. Let us please jam our hands together as we receive him. Thank you very much, Professor Folari. The Chancellor, Chairman, Board of Regents, Covenant University, Dr. David Oyedepo, esteemed members of the Board of Regents of our Citadel here present, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, permit me to stand on the protocol as established. It is with utmost pleasure that I welcome you to our 20th in the series of inaugural lectures of Covenant University titled Sequencing and Negotiating Nigeria's Regional and International Trade Agreements. It is a pertinent forum like this to reiterate the purpose for instituting inaugural lectures in the academia. As centers of knowledge, universities facilitate discoveries and innovation through published research outcomes which becomes basis for formulating policies that impact the socio-economic development of the nation. It is occasions like these that offer scholars like ourselves a channel to disseminate their, our research findings with a view to providing solutions to contemporary problems of a nation. Moreover, it is a moment of commemorating the elevation of the lecturer of the day to the professorial rank. It is a general consensus among economists worldwide that international trade predicated on specialization and comparative cost advantage leads to better quality of life for citizens of trading nations. However, one of the most debated issues in international economics is whether regional our multilateral trade relations is the most effective approach to realizing global free trade. Noting that internal weaknesses in a, demo, in a domestic economy could make a country disadvantaged in multilateral trade agreements. In the wake of globalization, technological development, the fourth industrial revolution, automation, International market conditions have changed considerably as market boundaries have become increasingly narrowed and nations are redefining their trade relations generally. By negotiating bilateral trade relations, even while consenting to multilateral trade agreements, developments in the international environment offer substantial opportunities for the achievement of national macroeconomic policy objectives when properly exploited. Consider the role of international trade in the economic development process. It becomes vital that Nigeria should review her existing trade policies to align with the current regional and international trade realities. The issue of sequencing and negotiating Nigeria's regional and international trade agreements is vital, contemporary, and an issue that must be addressed. Which is why today's lecture couldn't have occurred at a more opportune time and could have been delivered by a more heralded personality than our lecturer of today. Covenant has a leading global center of knowledge generation and creation, remains sensitive and committed to espousing viable pathways towards our aspirations for economic transformation and better quality of life. That is the reason why congratulating the lecturer of the day for this about to become momentous lecture, I will want to enjoin us all to please engage in and propagate this discourse beyond this meeting today to bring the desired policy changes to fruition 
for the betterment of our nation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vice Chancellor. I thought you were going to do it better. Thank you very much. I know a lot of things about the lecturer of today, but I'll tell you one or two. First, I know that he's a man of great knowledge and he's published widely in the field of international economic relations and by extension, international relations. I know that he was vice chancellor of Covenant University in acting capacity at some point. I also know that he's presenting today's lecture, which is titled Sequencing and Negotiation, Nigeria's Regional and International Trade Agreements. And this particular topic is close to my heart. I don't know about you. I believe it is one of the roadmaps by which Nigeria will land in that land of promise or that arena of promise. But I cannot tell you all because I have not been asked to come and tell you everything. We have someone that is going to make the presentation of the citation and indeed introduce the lecturer properly. And that person is a one-time dean of the College of Business and Social Sciences, one-time HOD of Economics Department, and is always, every time, a professor of economics. And that's Professor Olurati Ogunyola. Professor Olurati Ogunyola. Chancellor, sir. Please permit me to stand on all other protocols. I stand here to read the citation of Professor Jonathan Aremo, the inaugural lecturer of today. May I request Professor Aremo to please stand and remain standing while I read his citation. What is happening today is a fulfillment of prophecy. The details of that prophecy, I'm sure he will tell you when he comes on board. Professor Jonathan Adeyemi Aromi was born on 26th of April, 1954, to the family of Chief Aremu Bale and Mrs. Deborah Aremu of Oko, a record in local government area of Kwara State. Professor Aremu had his primary education from 1969 to 1965, and later gained admission into the Equa Teachers College, and was there from 1968 to 1972. He sat for the then University of London General Certificate of Education examination at ordinary level, and passed with flying colors. Professor Aremu then proceeded to acquire basic studies, and thereafter to University of Ibadan, where I graduated with a this BSc degree in economics in the year 1979. After the period of his NYC in Plateau State, Professor Aremu joined the research department of Central Bank of Nigeria as an assistant economist in 1980, where he made numerous contributions. One of his notable contributions was the research he carried out on the activities of the Industrial Development Coordinating Committee and Foreign Investment in Nigeria which led to the abrogation of the ICC degree 36 of 1988, and that decree was replaced with the Nigeria Investment Promotion Commission Act of 1995. I think it deserves a round of applause. <laughs> While in the Central Bank of Nigeria, Professor Remo earned accelerated promotions and became acting assistant director of research. He also enrolled for and earned Masters of Science and PhD degrees in University of Lagos and University of Abuja, respectively. His PhD degree is in the field of international relations with a specialization in international economic relations. Professor, Professor Aremu voluntarily retired from the services of Central Bank of Nigeria in 1992 to set up Market Link Consult. When Covenant University started in 2002, Professor Aremu was among the pioneer lecturers and at the same time a member of the Board of Regents. He became senior lecturer in the year 2003 and the acting vice chancellor, Covenant University, 
in September 2004 is membership. Let's do it loud for Jesus. The membership of the Board of Regents of Professor Aremo at Covenant University was transferred to Landmark University when the university was established in 2010. He was the pioneer pro-chancellor and chairman of council, Landmark University until 2012. In April 2015, Jonathan Aremo was appointed Covenant University Professor of International Economic Relations. In addition to his academic qualifications, Professor Aremo has had numerous experiences in international relations and negotiations. And I will list some of them. In, 20, in, in the year 2005, Professor Aremo was appointed as a member of the investment thematic group when the African, Caribbean, and Pacific countries resumed negotiations of economic partnership agreement with the European Union. He later became the main consultant of ECOWAS Common Investment Market. In the year 2007, Professor Aremo was appointed by the European Union, EU, as the financial expert to draft the Community Investment Code and the Investment Policy Framework for ECOWAS in preparation for the takeoff of ECIM in the region. Following after that, in 2009, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, UNIDO, appointed Professor Aremo in, as the national coordinator and team leader of UNIDO Investment Survey in Nigeria. Make it loud for Jesus. Also, he was among the national experts appointed by the Federal Government of Nigeria in 2012 to review the Nigerian trade and investment policy for implementation. He's currently a member of the Focal Point, appointed by Federal Government of Nigeria on trade and investment matters. And in October 2018, just last year, the Federal Government of Nigeria appointed him as a member and facilitator of the technical work group on the Nigerian impact and readiness assessment of the African continental free trade area. <clears throat> Professor Jonathan Aremo holds membership of reputable academic and professional societies. I will mention some of them. Some of these are listed here. Life member, Nigerian Economic Society since 1990. Life member, Nigerian Society of International Law since 1998. Member, the Nigerian Institute of Inter International Affairs since 1993. Member, the Institute of Management Consultants of Nigeria. And member, the Nigerian Economic Summit Group, NESG. And currently, Professor Aremo is the facilitator of trade, investment, and competitiveness of the group. Make it loud, make it loud. Thank you very much. Professor Jonathan Aremo has published widely in local and international journals. He is happily married, and the marriage is blessed with godly children. Professor Aremo is a man of April. He was born in April. He became a professor in April, and is having this inaugural lecture in April. May I therefore crave your indulgence to rise and receive the inaugural lecture of today in person of Professor Jonathan A. Aremu. Let's, let's continue to applaud him. Let's continue to applaud him. Well, shall we be seated? The Chancellor, sir. Members of the Board of Regents, our Vice Chancellor, members of Senate, 
the entire university communities. All other professors observed. Where the man introduced me make mention of something that means standing before you today is a product of prophecy. 1994, in this commission, myself and my wife were determined to produce bags which which they carried relief item to Rwanda. And our chancellor, after we did that, he said, you are not collecting money. I said, no. He said, you are moving from your world. W-A-R-U-D, you are moving into the world. Since that time, my movement has been from my world, W-A-R-U-D, to the world. <laughs> Chancellor, I appreciate you because of what you have shown into my life. You have told me so many things, they have all come to pass. And every blessing you see around me, around my children, apart from God, that is the man you can actually see that have poured a lot of anointing on me. The subject which I'm looking at today is a subject that Nigeria needs to pay critical attention to. So the first thing I want to say I believe you are putting it on the, okay? The title is as stated, and a lot of people have said it, sequencing and negotiating Nigerian regional and international trade agreement. Let me start by saying, why most economists believe liberalization of international trade is globally beneficial to all? The real truth is that it brings both gains and pains. And that is an anonymous quotation. Yes, pains. If they are not well sequenced and if they are not well negotiated. The outline of my presentation is as follows. I'm looking at introduction, the historical content of global trading arrangement, the various trade negotiation Nigeria is facing today how to resolve the main problem confronting developing countries, particularly Nigeria, and how do we formulate Nigerian trade policy. And then we now look at the way of sequencing and negotiating it with some basic, very important conclusions and recommendations. As I said earlier, most economists believe that trade liberalization is a good thing. However, Two questions demanding answers, which the lecturer wishes to address are why should the process of trade liberalization evolve sequentially? That is to say, some form of integration taking place before others. That is, why do countries not simply adopt every necessary opening of their reforms in trade? The next question is what factor should determine which of the trade issues that must be addressed first and which one have to be addressed later. Clearly speaking, the current globalization is most noticeable in trade. At the touch of a button, you can trade with any part of the world. And at the same time, the multilateral trade is coexisting with regional trade arrangement. The question is this, will regional trade arrangement not undermine what all of, our, all of us have agreed under the multilateral level of the World Trade Organization? A country's economic development, just as said by our PC, will be seriously affected the way such a country performs under the multilateral as well as regional negotiation of trade. For Nigeria, effective negotiation will be affected by more main thing, four main factors, particularly as at now. The first one is identification of trade and development objective within our National Economic Reform Growth Plan, which is the current National Development Plan. Secondly, 
formulation of an effective trade policy towards such objective that is found in the NERGP. Number four, putting in place the sequence of trade liberalization that is best suited for the country per time. And lastly, but not the least, establishment of an appropriate negotiation strategy at regional as well as multilateral level. One more question is this. Have Nigerians done this? Well, from my position, as you know, but I don't think we have done that at all. We have not sequenced, we have not negotiated well. The sad part of it is that Nigeria has no trade policy. The last one that was done, I was privileged to be one of those people that drafted in 2011, 2012. It was not signed to law. The only trade policy that is guiding the way we trade among nations in Nigeria today is the one that was done in 2001 and started execution in 2002. Definitely, that is an absolute trade policy. Well, to be able to look at this issue very well, let us see some historical content in global trading arrangements. We start with uh, mercantilism. Mercantilism believes that you should strive to trade. You should strive to export. Why? You should minimize imports. And in the 16th and up to 18th century, that was the opinion of everyone in the world. Everybody tried to sell export, but they don't want to import. The question is this. Everybody wanted to sell but they don't want to import so that they can conserve gold, they can conserve money. Then, if nobody wants to buy, then what you are producing, how will it go out? So, they concentrate so much on what is called favorable balance of trade, as opposed to development, as opposed to using trade to actually get what trade is expected to bring. Well, by, 19, by the 18th century, the theories of Adam Smith and Ricardo led to a new rethinking. And after the one, the victorious allies, particularly after the World War II, they forged a conscious opinion in liberalizing global trade. And that one led to the conclusion of the General Agreement of Tariff and Trade in 1947. Just recall, that that was not the only institution. In fact, that was not an institution. The main institution from the Brenton Wood Conference is that of International Monetary Fund to take care of balance of payment affecting nations. And then the second institutional set was the World Bank, which was to actually see to the reconstruction after the World War I and World War II. But the third institution that was to be set up was International Trade Organization. It was never set up. But a chapter in it is the chapter on general agreement on trade and tariff. And that one came on board in 1947. And since that time in 1947, until 1995, January 1st, there were a lot of trade rounds. That is, countries were meeting at different locations to be able to determine how do we lower tariffs. The first one was 1947. It took about seven months. It was done in Geneva. Second one was Anesi, it was about five months, 1949. The third one, Tokwe, it was done in 1950, with a lot of tariff cuts. For Geneva, which was 1956, as much as 2.5 billion tariff cuts was actually achieved. You can find this one inside the pamphlet that you are having. Then the Dillion round, the Kennedy round, the Tokyo round, the last of this round was the Uruguay round. We started in '66 and concluded in Marrakesh in April 14, 1994. And countries started putting their own acceptance to the new world created that was made from the Uruguay round negotiation. On the 4th of January 1995, the World Trade Organization was established. It was established to be able to see 
to the development so many things, among which are to provide a way of mitigating all desirable trade and investment action coming from other countries, permit nations to operate, operate predictable, secure, and transparent trade and commercial policy. Membership of WTO, by being a member, you are signaled to the entire world that you are one of those countries that are operating the best practices. There are other advantages which you will see in your pamphlet, including, very important one, the dispute settlement body, which is an institution to ensure that when countries are in trouble with respect to their trade relations, there can be a body that can look into it. In our whole region, we are all members of uh, WTO as well, though countries join at different times. You can see that table too. And then you will see the quite a lot of the WTO conference. But in table three, you will see the time each member state of ECOWAS joined. Nigeria joined WTO on the 1st of January 1995. The last country to join was Liberia, and uh, it was on the 16th of December 2005. Now, immediately that was created in 1947, just four, five years after, there's a new rethinking of having a regional arrangement. And that one led to the emergence of multilateral regionalism. That is to say, yes, we agree among the entire global space that we are going to have a WTO arrangement that takes care of everybody, but that should not stop those countries that wanted to operate a preferential arrangement among themselves. So we now have substantial number of countries going into regional trade negotiation among themselves. And these negotiations, they have increased in width as well as in depth. In width by the number of countries that are joining, in depth by the number of protocols which they permitted among themselves. And when you look at the faces, the faces can actually start from free trade area to custom union, custom union to common market, and common market to economic union. The loosest, the simplest of it is a free trade area in which countries that are coming together, they don't charge themselves any import duty. A higher level is to have a common CET under custom union in which not only shall we not be charging ourselves custom duties, but anybody exporting to our region, we are going to charge such an individual the same import duty. This is to actually prevent trade deflection. On and on, quite a lot of this emergence came within the multilateral setting where we have regional arrangement as, as well. But there are quite a lot of questions. If we all agree to have a multilateral trade environment, why having a regional trade agreement also? For one thing, what is the position of the South-South arrangement, developing countries having an economic integration among themselves? What about a situation where we have a developed country and a, South, a developing country having an economic integration among themselves? People have actually questioned that when you have an economic integration between a developed country and a developing country, it can lead to David and Goliath kind of relationship, which means it is only through God intervention that developing countries can win. And that is the main argument why economic partnership agreement is not being signed by Nigeria today. We shall be facing that again. So, in Article 24 of WTO, you can see the various uh, economic integration agreements as provided for by WTO. Article uh, 24 8 and B, Article 24 8 A. It also gives opportunity for an interim arrangement. That is to say, if you are in economic integration, you may not start everything at, at the same time. You can sequence your arrangement. But having agreed on these things, we still have another institution. They don't call themselves institution, but transnational corporation that does not take note of the comparative advantage in individual countries before they trade. 
A parent company of transnational corporation that is in UK can have a laminate in Nigeria, can have in Canada, can have in Australia. And when they are trading among themselves, they engage in what we call trade mispricing. They don't charge themselves the real price so as to ensure that the transnational corporation system benefits. That's what we call the over invoicing of imports and under invoicing of exports. If you have the outlet in Nigeria and then the outlet is buying from uh, Australia, the parent company of transnational corporation can tell the outlet in Australia selling to Nigeria, top that price, instead of $20, make it $50. So by the time it is coming to, let's say, Lever Brother in Nigeria, Nigeria will be paying $50. And the excess amount will be transferred to the headquarters of the transnational corporations. Also, if the athlete in Nigeria is selling product to Ghana, the headquarters can tell the Nigerian athlete, if that thing is $10, sell it to Ghana at $5. So that by the time they are paying Nigerian economy, they will only pay $5 to Nigeria. So whether exporting or importing, transnational corporations use what we call a trade mispricing, over invoicing of import and over invoicing of export to be able to cheat their host economy. You can see the picture of how they operate there. Now, faced with this multilateral system, faced with this increasing regionalization of the multilateral system, faced with the activities of transnational cooperation, the picture of what you are seeing here, what are the various trade negotiations facing Nigeria? Essentially, we are going to mention four here. Nigeria is faced without a trade policy to guide us. We are yet faced with ECOWAS common trade policy. Also, is African Economic Community Treaty with other African Union members. Also, we are faced with EPA Economic Partnership Agreement with European Union. And lastly, we are equally faced with multilateral negotiation at the WTO. On the ECOWAS front, ECOWAS created in 1975, treaty revised in 1993, but up to now, there is no common trade policy in ECOWAS. What we have is various protocols on free movement, on customs union, on other phases of economic integration. So you can say that our common Trade policy in ECOWAS is a submission of every protocol which ECOWAS has up to today. So, ECOWAS decided to have a common trade policy about two years ago because of what some of us are telling ECOWAS is not good. And even on 24th and 26th, I'm going to actually have been invited to speak on what has to be done to the common trade policy. Unfortunately, last year, when the member state of ECOWAS wanted to sign the common trade policy, Nigeria come up and say that it cannot sign because of inadequate consultation. And which means, as a result of Nigeria that dominates ECOWAS by about 70%, ECOWAS have no trade policy. The second negotiation is with the European Union. With the coming of the WTO, the preferences which we were enjoying with the European Union country being their colony can no longer work because it will violate what we call the most open nation clause. And therefore, WTO told the European Union, all your colonies, go and have an economic partnership agreement. And therefore, under the Cotonou Partnership Agreement, there was an economic partnership agreement that have about five thematic groups. I'm one of the privileged persons to serve in the a uh, thematic group on investments since 2004. But what happened? The negotiation was to be completed in 2014. Again, Nigeria declining signing the EPA, while other ECOWAS actually completed and signed on the premise that she require additional consultation. So, on both EU EPA, as well as economic common trade policy, Nigerian refused to sign. There are other reasons which Nigerian give. 
why we're not signing because it's afraid of the losses with respect to fiscal revenue and secondly the IPA development program which EU promised they don't know how they want to execute it and more importantly because within ECOWAS we have the least developed country which will continue to enjoy what we call the Lomi 4 agreement then that means their own products coming will be cheaper and then there can be a sort of trade deflation from all these 13 countries within the Kuwait. It is only the 12 countries within the Kuwait. It's only three that are developing. And those countries that are developing, uh, they will not enjoy the Lumi 4 agreement again. The third negotiation which Nigeria is facing is that of African Economic Community Treaty. 1980 to 1982, the Lagos Plan of Action was completed in which Organization of African Unity said we are going to have and strengthen the economic integration of the entire continent. The Lagos Plan of Action was done in Lagos. The African Economic Community Treaty was finalized in Abuja. And then you can look at the program of the integration. I think by 2017, Africa will have a free trade area. 2019, where we are now, we are going to be in Cust African Custom Union. 2023, African Common Market. 2028, we shall have Economic Union, which is the final fashion of an economic integration. When the negotiations started, Nigeria participated from the beginning to the end. And on 21st of March last year, it was concluded with four main protocols. Protocols on trade, protocols on services, and protocols on dispute settlements. I function as a member of rule of origin under trade in the negotiation. Paradoxically, Nigeria, that was instrumental to guarding support for the same African Economic Community Treaty, on the day of the signing, 21st of March last year, said he need to consult with domestic stakeholders. So Nigeria was not part of it. ECOWAS CTP, Nigeria need consultation. EPA, Nigeria need more consultation. At African Union, despite the naming of the process with Lagos Plan of Action and Abuja Treaty, Nigeria said they will not go into it because they need more consultation. On ending consultation, we don't know. Unfortunately, unfortunately, April 1st, 2019, the 22nd country, which is Gambia, ratified the Treaty of African Continental Free Trade Area. And once 22 countries ratified it, any other country that is coming into it, we have to go by accession. Accession means you will now go to individual African country to go and negotiate your position to be a member of African Continental Free Trade Area. That is the position Nigeria finds itself as at today. If the African Continental Free Trade Area come on border from tomorrow, and we want to join it, then we are going to negotiate, possibly with Benin first, we go to the next country, and then until we get to Djibouti. I said, and please put that next slide. I said that, I know that if Sami Okosu is alive today, he may like to sing the song for us concerning our trade matter, and which song, which way Nigeria. Why? At home, we don't have national trade policy. Within ECOWAS, we are not part of the common trade policy. In EPA, we say no. And under African continental free trade area, we constantly say no. Both ECOWAS and AU, they are leaving our country behind. So let's look at the World Trade Organization. Just like any other developing countries, the world trade has not been doing well to the developing countries. Why? Because the world trade grew out of God, and we were not part of the negotiation of God. As a member of Nigerian Society of International Law, we asked the Minister of Trade in Nigeria in 1995 why Nigeria should be a member of WTO, why we were not part in the negotiation. And the answer we can give is that Nigeria, under Abacha 10, then wanted to actually join the entire global body so that it can appeal to the entire world, the government of Abacha did not want to continue inconveniencing the entire world anymore. We did not participate in the negotiation of Uruguay, but we were the first signatory on the first 
of January 1995. Inside WTO, the essence is that countries will be the same. But look at the quotation of Ipin, the current DG of WTO, whom I met even two years ago under the ministerial conference in Argentina. He said, WTO is an organization in which all decisions are taken by consensus, where every member government holds the equivalent of UN Security Council veto, but there's also no denying the fact that some members are more equal than others when it comes to influence. And that is the situation. Other people say that why GATT was able to get substantial trade uh, um, tariff remover. In 25 years of WTO, we have not been able to move forward. Therefore, it is doubtful whether the multilateral system under the WTO will be of any benefit to uh, Nigeria. So that is why the general agreement on trade and tariff inside the WTO is no longer the general agreement on trade and tariff in 1970, uh, 1947. But people called the current general agreement on trade and tariff a general arrangement in talk talk. People are just talking under the ministerial conferences with no output. General agreement on trade on the talk talk, talking every two, two years. How do we resolve this problem that is facing developing countries, particularly in Nigeria? The first thing we WTO set up was the generalized system of preferences, that is to say, individual developed countries can actually lower preference that a product can enter their economy. That's number one, and that is what the relationship you find under the EPA, in which European Union wanted us, our product to enter their country at a special preference. We call it out the AGUA. We have other economic integration as well. The second one is the Doha Development Agenda. What is Doha Development Agenda? Many development countries say, when you are negotiating under the guard, we were not there. When you finalize to establish WTO, we were not there. Therefore, we only sign. The only thing you can do for us, have a development agenda for us. Our development agenda was actually occasioned and was, became compulsory because of what happened on, December, on September 11, 2001, in which the two main buildings in the World Trade Center came down because the developing countries thought there was a serious injustice in the global economy. And therefore, there are a lot of promises, because as I tell you today, people have said that since 2005, the Doha Development Agenda is not dead, but is in an under-intensive care, needing medical attention under the WTO system. Number three is the South-South Corporation. Okta that actually said that what about if developing countries can come among themselves? Well, that is okay, but again, what will they learn from themselves when majority of them are poor? What will they learn when quite a lot of them are still open to their metropolis, their former colonial master, to be able to decide, even their currency, particularly even with us in West Africa here? The fourth one we WTO put up is the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement. What does this one say? This one is saying that because developing countries, they don't have the soft and hard infrastructure. Therefore, let us see what we can do to assist them. So what they now did is that they now say, okay, categorize all these trading items into category A, category B, and category C. Under category A will be those things which you already have in your country that can allow you to sign the trade facilitation agreement. Category C will be where you need some little time, two years, three years, so that you can actually go ahead. Then category C is one in which you need capacity building to be assisted by developing countries. About uh, two months ago, we have a meeting of Global Alliance in which we look at the category A of Nigeria. And a lot of the items, when they say that we are qualified to actually sign the uh, uh, WTO trade facilitation agreement, we never satisfy the condition. So, the last one of the initiative is the issue of aid for trade. Aid for trade is that 
developing countries discover it's going to be difficult for them to trade with develop, uh, developed countries. And therefore, there is need for aid. Particularly, the Ministerial Conference Forum in Hong Kong came up that essentially there will be more, more kind of aid, technical trade-related assistance, trade-related infrastructure, producing capacity to be able to upgrade the supply of their product, and trade adjustment assistance. So these are the various programs which were put in place by WTO to be able to assist Nigeria as well as other developing countries. This is the situation where we are. And there's a need to formulate a new trade policy for Nigeria. We have none now. And it's very insulting. The leading country in Africa has no trade policy. A new trade policy is overdue. Without which we can't actually go into a very good negotiation, talk less of sequencing. Because there is no direction of where we wanted to go to. And that is the real problem. So, what strategy will Nigeria need? Given the importance of a trade policy in Nigerian economic reconstruction and growth plan, the major question is what objective needs to be set? What institutional arrangement do we need? What about the regional dimension? Are the current regional arrangement okay for us? Quite a lot of other uh, numerous questions. But to me, I've actually said well, a good strategy in trade policy formulation would be to determine, we need to look at four items. Only domestic issues we can have total control. Largely domestic, not totally domestic. There are issues which, as a result of our negotiating with other people, our agreement with other people, we cannot do what we want. We have to listen to that, particularly the WTO. Externally negotiated, like ECOWAS, EU, and uh, African Union, as well as WTO. The last one is externally non negotiated, where we don't have any reason to be part of the negotiation, but we have to comply. So clearly, we need to design a new trade policy, and those policies must ensure that the following are put into place. Putting in place an executive trade policy organogram is in figure three. You will see that figure in the paper with you. After that one, the trade that we, we have to design a trade policy that is in support of National Economy Reconstruction and Growth Plan. And that is equally available in Figure 4. Also, there's need to establish trade policy dialogue and consultation process, which we have not been doing enough. And that is one of the biggest reasons why Manufacturing Association of Nigeria, as well as uh, Labor Union said, Buhari should not actually go into signing of uh, the African Continental Free Trade Area. And lastly, we need to develop trade negotiation strategy by building up the capacity of Nigerian Office of Trade Negotiation. That office was set up, but as I'm talking to you today, there is no law that allows it to operate. I was listening to one of the National Assembly members talking, and he said that we don't need anyone to do negotiation for us again. Well, it's only in the Bible where you forget those who doesn't know what they are doing. I don't think that is correct. We need office of trade negotiation, just like America, just like any other country. But, and that is the problem we are facing among so many. So, sequencing and negotiating Nigerian trade agreement arrangement. From this lecture, how do we sequence? The first point of call, there must be national trade policy that is in line with the current development plan. Economic Reconstruction and Growth Plan. After a national trade policy, the next one in the sequence should be ECOWAS Common Trade Policy. With Nigerian trade policy, we can negotiate ECOWAS trade policy. Because we know what we needed at home, therefore within ECOWAS, there's no problem in locating what we need within our region. After ECOWAS trade policy, 
The next sequence is African Continental Free Trade Area. If you sign the EPA before African Continental Free Trade Area, the ambition of European Union, which they have done, is cutting Africa into four regions. ECOWAS, SADEC, COMESA, and East African Community, and negotiate with them differently. That is why African Union came together, let us have our own African Economic Community, so that this EPA will not actually slash us into prisons. So, with Equatorial policy, the next one is conclusion of African Continental Free Trade Area. With that one, we can go ahead to have an economic integration with European Union under the EPA. And after this one, as the entire African, we cannot negotiate under the WTO. This sequence of engagement permits a progressive harmonization of the various trade agreements of the country with both regional and multilateral levels. Ladies and gentlemen, we call any capacity improvement as well as formation of coalition. Even if you set up national Nigeria Office of Trade Negotiation today, you have to build the capacity of the institution. You have to probably have to build the capacity of the negotiator, the people working there. That office was set up in 2017, and I was privileged to be among those people who the United, United Nations Economic Commission for Africa employed to be able to train them. Apart from that three days training, no other training has been given to them. But again, there is no law backing it up, so it may be crap anytime from now. Coalition building. We can't do it alone. We must actually make sure we work with other African countries, other ECOWAS countries. What are the conclusions from this, my lecture? State governance have been subjected to multilateralism and regionalism over the years. Unfortunately, signature to all this, inside it, the agreement behave as if all of us are the same. It is not so. In Nigeria, without appropriate trade policy, without technical expertise, we create a very good sequence of negotiation. We shall not be able to know what to do and what not to do. With increasing regional agreement in the multilateral trading environment facing Nigeria, the country must do these 10 points as a matter of urgency. Number one, establish appropriate trade policy development strategy that agree with economic reconstruction and growth plan. Use the strategy to formulate a several trade policy by engaging executive trade policy formulation as presented in the organogram three. Review the existing and large national focal points of which I'm a member of in the country so that we can have a better policy dialogue and consultation process so that people will not complain they, do, they are not aware. Put in place effective and efficient trade negotiation strategy and sequence them within the multiplicity of the trading agreement. Finalize the establishment of the National Nigeria Office of Trade Negotiation and put in place technical competent negotiators in the office as well as develop their capacity to negotiate. Number six, synchronize the sequence of negotiation that agree with our economy, growth, and development plan. Number seven, carry out extensive exercises so that nobody will say, I'm not aware, and then the issue of further consultation will not arise. Engage in appropriate coalition with other countries in future trade negotiation. Number nine, review the country position within the existing economic integration, such as ECOWAS, EPA, AGOA, Africa Continental Free Trade Area. And lastly, but not the least, without further delay, sign African Continental Free Trade Area Treaty and use the readiness study, of which I am part and parcel, I don't know whether I'm still there, with the President consulted, to ratify Nigerian position, if it is still possible. I say if it is still possible because we have got the minimum number of countries to ratify it, so if by tomorrow that particular treaty is deposited with WTO, then under Article 24, we can only become member when we are ready for what we can call accession. And accession means 
we have to go around all the 55 member nations of African Union to be able to defend our reason why we should be a member of that, uh, of that arrangement. So, Mr. Chancellor, sir, the academic community, I've been able to say something, but what is very important is that in business as in life, you cannot get what you deserve. You can only get what you negotiate. This is now my own quotation. It's by Chester Karras. Nigeria must therefore be ready to sequence and negotiate a position on trade issues. The time is running out. Instead of unending consultation excuses, so, as, so that we shall be able to get what we deserve within the global setting as well as within the regional trade agreement. Thank you for the opportunity. I was thinking that was not enough. Not after the erudition of that delivery on trade agreements and all of the roadmaps that Nigeria requires. Please let us have our seat. Thank you so much, the lecturer of today, Professor Jonathan Aremu. We are also glad to have in the house the spouse of the lecturer of the day, Mrs. Jonathan Aremu. You're welcome, ma'am. Other dignitaries here present include Mr. Ibukun Ola Akinria Day. That's researcher, Nigerian Economic Summit Group. Please let us uh, see you and then I appreciate your coming. <laughs> Professor Dukwe Akintobi, a scientist from Federal University of Agriculture, Abel Kuta. Mr. and Mrs. Aremu of the Living Faith Church, Ewekoro. And then, of course, Dr. John Isemede, an export technician in Lagos. Export tech, Lagos. You're welcome, sir. And welcome, ma'am. At this point, I'll be inviting the vice chancellor to perform the next assignment. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, you will agree with me that that has been a most interesting lecture, a very educating lecture. If you agree with me, can you give a wonderful round of applause again for the lecturer of the day? It is on this note I will ask us to please rise. As I most respectfully invite the Chancellor of Covenant University for his remark. Chancellor, sir. whether you wanted me to dance or what you are trying to do. Thank you all for coming and I want to congratulate the lecturer today for showing that he belongs to that sect of life by bringing all real life issues to bear and addressing this subject. Wherever capacity is lacking, Leadership is bound to fail. Our greatest problem today in this country is the placement of ignorant people in position of authority. Everything you need for that negotiation is not one day, it's not one month, it's not three months, it's not four months. And now we have virtually become irrelevant. Even with West African saying that we found it and we are funded. Nigeria funds ECOWAS now. The last country signed about last month, that makes it 22. And now we now have to go to Chad 
go to the jail. Can we please come? Can you accept us? All because of lack of capacity. Please get people. There are three skills that makes great leadership. One, capacity. Non-negotiable. You don't have capacity, you cannot deliver. The world is becoming increasingly more complex. There is need to be conscious of the competitiveness that we are confronted with. It's a moving world. And now we are in a static nation. Behind almost behind in almost everything. Because The inner strength required to say, now, this is the next step to take, is nowhere to be found. Ask anybody today who don't know. Some don't even know their name and their leadership. That's where we find ourselves. But there's a way out. And I pray. God will use this kind of platform to help chart a way forward. As I listened to the sequence of that lecture, I felt sorry for us as a people. Most people today in our various settings, legislative arm, don't even know the meaning of WTO. They don't know the meaning. So when would they know the implication of slow action? That's where we have found ourselves. But everything falls or rises on leadership. I have a big question on leadership capacity in our country. Big question. And that at all levels. Big question. Yes, we need to pray, and we need to come up with strategies on how to force the way forward. Without carrying stones and sticks. Engaging platforms like this around the country who are forward-looking and are committed to seeing a brand new nation come alive. No trade policy, a nation of this size. How are you running? And if you check what they are, the legislature, what they are, the Senate, the House of Reps, you'll be allowed for doing what? For sitting and sleeping. Because of God's people in this country, there is hope. And all we need to do is to take responsibility and ensure we don't watch this nation go down. Almost no data is reliable. 99% are now employed. Where are they? Do we not be able to locate them? Now we have those three C's that I developed sometimes back. I call them, I call this capacity, character, and courage. If you don't have capacity, you will lack courage. It is knowledge that imbues confidence. Now there is no capacity. There is no courage, and character is in doubt. Everybody knows. Character is in doubt. When you put a gun on somebody's head to announce a result, 
of election in this age. This age. And they say, I'm under stress now. I'm under stress now. <laughs> and then the one who put you under stress is still walking on the street. So, if you fail the three C's, then you are down. And that's why we're where we are today. I've never seen political party membership card in my life. Anyone that I saw like this. Only one of those who is committed to the change of story of our nation. We are bereaved of capacity, bereaved of character, bereaved of courage. So where are we going? I saw you and I knew something was in you. So I said, look, go for your PhD. I told you that you didn't tell that. I told you. Praise God. Because we need people who will help us find out where we are going wrong and how to recover ourselves. Now that we are just in this room and we are no members of any, uh, any part of the three-tier government, except you are there sometimes. <laughs> okay. But uh, this must be aired out. That we kept sleeping as a nation and then we were edged out of WTA, African uh, something. We are just out. What happened? We were asleep. Choking. Struggling for survival. God help Nigeria. Nigeria must be out of the woods. To stay here for too long, it's already devastating. We will not watch it. God will help us to find a way forward. And it's in the hand of everybody sitting down here. Young people who are here, we have spent quite some bit of our own time. <laughs> you are the one who feels the music. If you don't wake up to be part of the needed change and departure, so we can create a future. But by the grace of God, we will live, all of us here, we will live to see a new Nigeria. God will intervene on our behalf, and everybody's input will not end up in vain. Again, congratulations for a most um, insightful lecture, a most practical approach to dealing with issues, and for those fantastic recommendations, which I believe we should push to them, whether they can read it or not, push it to them. Whether they will look at it or not, push it to them. But the university has that duty. Let's publish. Let's make it known. Let's announce it everywhere. Also tell them, I say, we lack three things that are fundamental. Capacity, missing. Character, zero. Courage, non-existent. So that's why they will be signing everything, and then you say, you name up. Nigeria doesn't need it. Chad doesn't need it. We need it. Your best brains around the world are Nigerians. Then ask me if they consulted anyone. They have time. Let's win election. Let's do what we like. That's not life. Somebody has said politicians think only of the next election. Only statesmen think of the future. So when I met and I said, what will this place look like in 500 years? Oh, they have gone bother the bow. We're not bothered about what, what is happening now. It's great, but what would this be like in 500 years when we are gone? The next after us is gone. The one after us is gone. What will it look like? Why is it only in Africa that we cannot build a structure that creates a future? Today, Harvard is 388 years. 388 years. And it's still going. Cambridge is 1,020 years now. And it's still going. Secondary school built some five years ago, run down. Wind has come, carried the roof because there was nothing serious going there. And they are still there. They are under the trees. They are still there. In today's world, we used to sing a song years ago in SU. 
Stop, 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 stop. Everybody stop. Stop, stop and think. Stop and see the end of the way you are going. Stop, stop, stop. I think it's time to stop and think. And review our steps so we can create a future that everybody needs. Thank you and God bless. That is our vintage chancellor, Dr. David Oyedepo. Let us put the hands together once again to appreciate him for that beautiful and insightful submission. Thank you very much, sir. Let us please have our seat. You can imagine that in this age, we are still talking about the president of a country possessing a school certificate. And whether he has passed it or not, it's not an issue, so long as he has school certificate. No capacity, no capacity. It is well in Jesus' name. At this juncture, I will be inviting the head of the Department of Economics and Development Studies, Dr. Dominic Azu, to give the vote of thanks. Chancellor, sir, I'm greatly honored to anchor this vote of thanks, and it must not be taken for granted. First and foremost, we give all glory to God, the giver of all wisdom and knowledge, for making every one of us witness this day, and for making this inaugural lecture a huge success. For without God, we can do nothing on our own. We also acknowledge the untiring commitment of the university leadership, starting with our dear chancellor and chairman board of president, Dr. David Oyedepo, and the other members of the board of regents here present. The management team led by our member vice chancellor, deputy vice chancellor, and all other principal officers. We appreciate the faculty and staff of this great university as well as our kings and queens in Hebron. May the Lord bless you beyond bounds. Most importantly, we appreciate all our invited guests for honoring our invitations. We thank you for coming, and we pray that God Almighty will honor you and grant you journey messages as you return to your various destinations. To so our inaugural lecturer of today, Prof. Jonathan Aremu, we salute you and thank you for your intellectually stimulating and nourishing lecture. May God continue to give you grace and add more feathers to your cap. Once again, we appreciate everyone for making time to be here. Thank you and God bless you. Dr. Dominic as the head of Department Economics and Development Studies. In the course of the program, we also had a dignitary, a very important uh, person, Mr. Leonard Ubaja, Executive Director, Center for Trade and Business Advocacy. Please let us, sir. Uh, okay, you're welcome, sir. Thank you. So, um, before the next uh, assignment, I'd like to quickly announce that shortly after this program, after the procession, as we remove our gowns and um, we just proceed straight to the Center for Learning Resources for a, a brief cocktail to celebrate the lecturer and indeed to celebrate the addition to knowledge today. Um, it's also important that our special guests that are here also uh, proceed to the Center for Learning Resources. You'll find some details around that we direct to. We also are admonishing that we do it in an orderly fashion, as we have, by the time we are proceeding, we'll have members of the high table, uh, the principal officers led by the chancellor, will also make a procession to the Center for Learning Resources for the cocktail. 
I hope this uh, announcement is in perspective. Thank you very much. To perform the next assignment, I once again respectfully invite our Vice Chancellor, Professor E. 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 Atayero. <laughs> Shall we rise as I respectfully invite the Chancellor of Covenant University for the closing benediction and blessing. Shall we pray? Father, we give you thanks for the success of this inaugural lecture and for the light you have shed on our heart through this presentation. Receive our thanks in the name of Jesus. We pray that you will make this happen in a lifetime as we make Nigeria be a new identity. Father, we pray that everyone in position of authority will think Nigeria above themselves. We pray that all of the brains that you have blessed us with in this nation will start responding to the call for duty. I pray that together we secure our future for our children's children will not become fugitives in other people's countries. This place will be a worthy place to live, a place where there will be no fear, a place where each one will make a living and help to make others live. Let it be, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We pray, Lord, that we grant sound leadership for our country at all levels. We write our story. Give us a new name. And on these trade issues that have been exhaustively discussed today, I pray that you will stir up all the ones in authority over this area and reposition our great nation. Let Nigeria not go down the drain in the name of Jesus. Now guide us as we live here today. All of our friends and invited guests who have come, you have brought them there here safely, please return them back home safely. And let it be well with everyone. Let it be well with our country. Let be well with our region. Let be well with our continent. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for the inaugural lecture of today. Let your good hand remain upon him and upon his family for more grace and greater impact. Thank you for this university and now you are helping us. Thank you for your grace upon this university, the leadership, the management, and for how far you have led us. Receive our thanks in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' precious name we have prayed. Shall we share the goodness in fellowship? Surely, God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the presence of the Lord forever and ever. Peace. So, we shall be having... The CU anthem, and thereafter, there shall be a procession in the reverse order. This time, to be led by the Chancellor and Chairman Board of Regents. CU anthem, please.
Thank you. Still standing, we shall be having the procession. Take this way out. And then, of course, uh, we will still be, we'll be standing while members of the University Senate will join the procession out. Let us have you roll, please. Thank you. We expect all